Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the Director of Health Education for the NHA, and I'm absolutely delighted today to have as my guest, uh, Gene Bauer. Gene is the uh, president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary, which is actually a location, but also an organization. It's a 300 plus acre farm in uh, kind of upstate New York. Uh, as home to over uh, 800 animals of all kinds, ducks, geese, chickens, turkeys, all of that, which I love. Um, and also, uh, really, it's a, a, a model and a, a, an inspiration for, you know, animal rights, animal protection, and the entire farm sanctuary movement. Gene is also the author of two books, one called uh, The Farm Sanctuary, uh, really a... Uh, changing the hearts and minds about animals and food and the farm sanctuary life, which is the ultimate guide to eating more mindfully, uh, living longer and being happier day to day. Gene, I'm so happy you're here. Welcome. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association, the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle as well as water-only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Welcome. It's wonderful to be be with you. Thank you very much for having me. You know, a lot of people get into, um, let's start with the idea of veganism itself. You know, sometimes from personal health issues, recovery, family issues. But I gather from reading your bio that this was very much an ethical drive for you, that this was something that was very much about uh, animal rights. So take me through that very early part in your humble beginnings of your journey, uh, uncovering uh, that information and maybe being aware of information in like uh, slaughterhouses and factory farms and, and stockyards and things like that with these deplorable conditions and how that drove you to do some of what you do. Yes, absolutely. Well, well I grew up eating meat like everybody around me without really thinking about it. You know, we are very much social animals. We tend to do what those around us do. But I also saw lots of harm in the world around me. You know, ecosystems being destroyed, wars, violence. Uh, I grew up in the Hollywood Hills and I rem remember beautiful old trees, old oak trees being cut down so houses could be made bigger. And seeing this sort of thing, made me feel that I did not want to be a cog in a wheel of behaviors and of a system causing so much harm. So in high school and in college, I started volunteering with various nonprofit organizations. Many of these were focused on environmental issues or social justice issues. And as time went, I started learning about factory farming and how harmful it was to animals, to the earth, uh, and to ourselves. And I remember the first time I learned about the cruelty of factory farming was when my grandmother told me about how veal calves are raised, chained by the neck in crates for their whole lives. So I was in high school when that happened. So it was an ongoing iterative process of learning. And in 1985, I decided to go vegan, meaning to eat no animal products. And in 1986, I co-founded Farm Sanctuary, which works to expose the cruelty of factory farming. And we actually started by doing investigations to see firsthand what was happening. And during these investigations, we would find living animals literally thrown in trash cans or left on piles of dead animals. So we started rescuing them. And at first we didn't have a long-term vision or even a two year or three year plan for creating an organization. Uh, but it has grown, uh, and, you know, we started out as an all volunteer organization, in fact, and we used to fund it by selling vegan hot dogs at Grateful Dead shows. Well, I wanted, to, I wanted to touch on that because I thought that was so amazing. You know, prior to all the uh, crowdfunding and all of that, you were selling uh, vegan hot dogs in parking lots to deadheads at Grateful Dead concerts. Did that actually work? Were you able to actually generate income doing that? Absolutely, it worked. You know, That's we amazing. were a very hungry crowd and we were there all all day and all night. 
and um, you put in long hours, but we would sell thousands of these in a day. Wow. So you and, would follow uh, the band around to different concert venues? Is that how you did that? We did, yes. Uh, <laughs> on the East Coast, we didn't go. We, the furthest west we went was Wisconsin, uh, Alpine Valley. We did a show there, but we were primarily on the East Coast, going up and down the East Coast. And uh, we did this for a few years and mainly in the summers. And it was a good way to raise funds and also to raise awareness because, you know, we also had literature and information and, and educational materials at our table. And so people would learn about these issues and some people became farm sanctuary supporters as well, but it was largely veggie hot dog sales that was the primary income source. That's just an unbelievable, that's about the hippiest thing you've ever done in your life. You know that, right? It's pretty fun, man. I got to tell you, it was pretty neat. It was a very open-minded crowd, as you can Oh, imagine. yeah. Well, absolutely. Did you ever get to know the band at all in, the, in that journey? Um, not during those days, but I actually had the opportunity to go to their 50th anniversary Fare Thee Well tour, and I got a ticket in Chicago, and I met Bob Weir there for the first time. And um, more recently, for our 35th anniversary, I was able to interview him about what it the whole hippie culture and how it aligns with what we're doing at farm sanctuary and he's now a vegan so it was a really great conversation and you know i asked him sort of what is at the core of of hippie values and he said you know there's that saying if it feels good do it but he then kind of amended it and said if it feels right do it do things that feel right feel compassionate and he really focused on the importance of kindness which is very core to what Farm Sanctuary is about. So, you know, what was happening at the Grateful Dead shows, the sort of spirit around those shows, the community around those shows, the feeling of belonging and of acceptance of others is something that is kind of core to Farm Sanctuary. It's the same sort of acceptance and this kindness and this uh, inclusive approach to everybody, including non-human animals. Well, you know, I, you know, uh, you know, Martin Luther King at one time was quoted as saying, you know, our lives basically come to a, a halt when we stop speaking about things that really matter. And I have to say, you're one of those people where words are important, but look, deeds have to match words. And you've done a lot of work um, really with, you know, the approach to legislation to really change how animals are created and how they're housed and, and some of these really despicable ways that these animals are treated in the intensive farming uh, setup, as well as how they're crated and transported and utilized. So, so speak to, if you can, how you move from setting up the kind of organization that you did to now going into the outreach in terms of a really more active mobile activation or activism related to these kinds of, uh, these kinds of deeds that needed to be done to bring light to what's going on. Well, when we first started, we thought, okay, if we show people what is happening, we'll document the conditions, take pictures, show people what is happening, people will be appalled and they'll all go vegan, right? So that's a pretty simplistic approach. But we learned very early on that we could not rescue ourselves out of this problem. We could only rescue a very small number of animals that ultimately we needed, needed to educate people and change laws and change practices. So early on, we actually started campaigning. And one of our first campaigns had to do with preventing downed animals, animals who, who are too sick even to walk. Uh, we tried to prevent those from being sold at stockyards and going into, this, into slaughterhouses to be used for human food. And we were actually able to convict a stockyard of cruelty to animals for mistreating downed animals. But that took seven years of campaigning. And then we continued working to ban the slaughter of downed animals through state and federal legislation. And it took about 15 years or more than 15 years to finally succeed at banning the slaughter of downed cows for human food. And one of the reasons this happened was that downed cows are more likely to have mad cow disease. And there was evidence and the USDA finally admitted that downed cows are more likely to have mad cow disease. And that's why they ultimately agreed with our petition and our legal uh, point that these animals should not go into the food supply. So we're continuing to do legislative work. We've also been involved in initiatives and other efforts to ban 
the inhumane confinement of animals in cages and crates where they can't even turn around. The first one was in Florida. We succeeded there in 2002 to ban gestation crates. These are two foot wide metal enclosures where pigs used for breeding are kept for years. They live most of their lives unable to walk, turn around. They're standing on concrete or slatted floors. They scrape against the bars of their cages. They have bruises on their bodies. Uh, they, are, they suffer physically and they also suffer emotionally from being in these cages. So we were able to ban those gestation crates in Florida in 2002. There's now about 10 states around the country that ban gestation crates or other uh, intense forms of confinement. So that's something we've done as well. Uh, but we're now increasingly looking to build new kinds of opportunities for farmers to actually grow plant foods. You know, stopping cruelty, banning crates is one thing, and I'm glad we've done that and will continue to do that. But even when you ban a small crate, the animals are still kept in pretty inhumane conditions. So they're less bad, but they're definitely not good. And we're now in the process of really trying to craft policies and create systemic reforms to tilt the billions of dollars that are spent every year by the US Department of Agriculture. And most of that money goes to support factory farming. So if we can start tilting some of those systemic supports towards community-centered plant-based agriculture, I think that's where we're gonna see significant reforms in the coming years. A couple of things come to mind. The farm sanctuary was probably the first of its kind or something close to the first of its kind. Would you say that that's true? Yes, I, I don't think there was any such thing as a farm sanctuary before we were founded in 1986. Yes. And, did, and did it spearhead or was it at the vanguard of kind of a now a sanctuary movement? Did that feed into collaboration with other states, other countries, even internationally, where now the sanctuary kind of situation would expand into other countries and the mindset of other places? Did you see that happen? Yes, absolutely. We, uh, in fact, some folks that came to Farm Sanctuary, spent some time with us, have now started sanctuaries in other parts of the country. They're involved with sanctuaries around the world. There are now hundreds, if not thousands of sanctuaries. And, you know, the Farm Sanctuary movement is evolving like everything. And we started out by focusing on rescuing animals from cruelty. And we will continue doing that, as I, as I mentioned. But in addition to that, I think now we have opportunities to utilize the land where our sanctuaries currently operate to grow food and to start demonstrating solutions to the problem. And there are some sanctuaries now starting to do this. Uh, so re animal rescue is part of it, demonstrating and empowering people to take steps towards healthy plant-based vegan living is also very important. And I, I know, uh, we're doing more in that direction now. I, I noticed the main place is up in Watkins Glen. So it's up in upstate New York, but you have an ancillary place out in Acton, California, which is a little bit smaller. So when animals are rescued or sent to you, are they sent from every state of the union? I mean, how does it work? Or is it more local to where you are that these rescue efforts would be focused on your sanctuaries? Well, we've taken in animals from all over the country. Um, we also network with other sanctuaries. So if we can't take them, we'll sometimes help transport them. We were recently involved in a big rescue uh, of a, a farmer in Oklahoma who no longer wanted to kill his cattle. So we help place some of those at our place uh, on the East Coast and with other sanctuaries in Florida, for example, and also with sanctuaries on the West Coast in California. So uh, we are a nationwide organization. We have a nationwide network of other sanctuaries that we work with to place animals. It really touched my heart that I noticed also that when there are environmental catastrophes that affect the welfare of animals, you've stepped up and really like from Hurricane Katrina, I noticed that there were hundreds of animals that you wound up uh, taking in that were you know, put in harm's way because of those environmental catastrophes. So that's kind of a whole other level I, that's really amazing to me too. Speak to that just a little bit, how, how that transpired when we had these catastrophes and how that got targeted to your location and organization. Yes, when there are hurricanes or other natural disasters, you know, we hear a lot about people who are losing their homes there. And, and of course, that's very tragic, but there's very little attention paid to the farm animals who also are suffering and often dying uh, in these conditions. And, 
you know, millions of them. We're talking about millions of animals and it's not something many people think about. So we have been able to rescue some animals, hundreds or sometimes thousands of animals from these kinds of conditions. But even rescuing thousands of animals is a drop in the bucket. And um, even today, there's something called avian influenza. It's a, a respiratory disease that's afflicting birds in factory farms across the US. And so far, over 50 million birds have been killed because of this avian influenza. And sometimes they're being killed by these egregious methods of what they call ventilation shutdown, where they actually have these crowded factory farms and they actually shut down the vents and heat it up. So the animals die of heat stress, essentially, over the course of hours. So even so in those cases, we're now trying to prevent factory farms in the first place so that we don't have these situations where so many animals are killed in such egregious ways. But even with other disasters, you know, when you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of animals, uh, sanctuaries can only rescue a small number. And that's why we really need to see systemic reforms. Uh, ideally, we would like to work ourselves out of a job so we never have to rescue animals from these conditions. Uh, but we have a long way to go and we help where we can. But ideally, we would like to you know, have these factory farms out of, you know, creating a situation where we're not going to have to worry about these problems. There's so many questions come to mind. We're going to take just, I'm here with Gene Bauer, the president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. We're going to take just a short break to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. And now to put a smile on the sponsors of the National Health Association, you're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is $35 per year for those living within the U.S. and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication mailed to your home or offices, loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the 2023 NHA Conference set for June 23 to the 25th, 2023, in Cleveland, Ohio, which will be the NHA 75th Annual NHA Conference. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm here with Gene Bauer, the president and co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. Gene, I wanted to ask you, before you made the point that you were instrumental in legislation that changed how animals were crated. We talked about gestational crates, these really despicable crates for pigs and the pens and crates for veal animals, you know, calves, baby calves. Uh, and you said that you were instrumental in getting those changes in about 10 states. What, what are the obstacles in the other 40 states? What, what interferes with people saying, look, this is the right thing to do? What, you know, you, 10 states have come on board. What are the obstacles you find in the states that resist that kind of change? Well, animal agriculture is very powerful. They're very entrenched for many years. In fact, before we were able to get the law, the first law passed in Florida in 2002, we had bills introduced in state legislatures. And what happens is that these bills are referred to the Agriculture Committee. And this also happens in Washington, DC, when you have federal legislation to protect farm animals or to deal with farming practices, it goes to the Agriculture Committee. And the Agriculture Committee in Washington and in states is very friendly to agribusiness. And so we had bills introduced, they would typically die without even getting a hearing. And so that is still happening, unfortunately, and that's why many states do not have these laws. The way we have been able to get laws passed, actually, has typically been through the initiative process. So in the state of Florida, we had a bill introduced to ban gestation crates. It went to the Agriculture Committee in the state legislature, and it died without a hearing. 
So we then took this measure to the people through a citizen's initiative, which means that you collect enough signatures to get a measure on the ballot for a popular vote. And this is how we succeeded for the first time. It is how we also succeeded in Arizona, the second state to do this. And it's how we succeeded in California, the third state to do this. And then after these successes, we started going to other states with an initiative process. And we would begin an initiative process at the same time as we were talking to the legislature. And so it came down to, do you want an initiative or are you willing to negotiate with us and pass legislation? And that's how most of those laws have passed. And so the states that have not passed this are do not have the initiative process or they're very uh, big agricultural states where the political uh, pressure of agribusiness is, is too much to overcome at this time, even though most citizens would agree with us. You know, whenever you do polling, yeah. you find that the majority of citizens agree that these conditions are unacceptable, but we, but we just do not have the political uh, power right now to, to pass legislation. Well, I've, I've I noticed in, in in reading about what you were doing that you have experience going toe to toe with the Department of Agriculture and some of these House subcommittees, and you've had some success. When, when you go into an environment like that, take me through that. Is there just a lot of eye rolling because of agribusiness, and you have to overcome this inertia, or do you really find empathetic and sympathetic people that will identify with the message to some degree? And now you've got some somebody on your side. And do you have any lobbyists or any people like that that work on your behalf, on the behalf of this message? Yes, we occasionally have had folks from agribusiness join with us and support legislation to prevent some of the worst cruelties. Uh, there was a dairy farm veterinarian in California, for example, who spoke out against the inhumane treatment of downed cows and, most, and they suffer terribly. These are largely dairy cows who are pushed beyond their biological limits. They're pushed to produce 10 times more milk than they would normally produce. They have a calf every year who's taken away from them. So they have very difficult lives and many of them become downed animals, too sick to walk. And this dairy farm veterinarian witnessed this and it, and it got to him. He didn't think it was okay. And so he joined with us to enact legislation in California and eventually we were able to support and, and pass federal uh, policies against downed animal suffering. But when this dairy veterinarian spoke out and joined with us, he was ostracized by the dairy industry. And there, that makes it very difficult. So you have people in the industry who are pressured and penalized when they speak out against inhumane industry practices. So mm -hmm. there have been a few, but not very many. And so what we're trying to do now is reach out more into the farming community, find farmers who have common ground with us and, and build from there. And, but, but most farmers, unfortunately, are on the factory farming treadmill. They are indebted to agribusiness. They take out loans, for example, to build factory farming warehouses, and now they have to pay off those loans. So they have to continue on this treadmill. So, so many farmers are kind of stuck and we're now trying to find farmers who we can help get unstuck and create new opportunities and also new farmers who have not gone down this factory farming path, who we can align with to create a new type of food system. So it's going to be a, a diverse approach here, but uh, people in the industry oftentimes have a hard time getting out of it. What, what's the pipeline for finding those people that you've just described? different farmers, acceptable people that are open to the message. How, how do you set that in motion? Take me through the mechanics of that just a little bit. I think we need to interface more in agricultural communities. Part of this is by showing up at farm conferences. You know, they have agricultural conferences all over the country, being present there, uh, getting to know people who work at farms, who would prefer a different approach. So Farm Sanctuary has a farm. We take care of animals. Some of the people who work at Farm Sanctuary used to work on farms. We're located in a farming community. There are other farm sanctuaries in farming communities. So just by being more engaged in our communities, we can learn about ways to support certain farmers and who are approaching it in a more compassionate way. And ideally, we're supporting plant-based farmers that are producing healthy food and paying the workers well. So that's the kind of food system we need to move towards. Uh, it's gonna be a process. And I also think that farm sanctuary and sanctuaries like ours 
can grow food and can model that type of agriculture as well. Uh, create internships and apprenticeships for farmers on our own properties. We haven't quite got that happening yet, but that's an opportunity I think before us. I'm here with uh, Gene Bauer, the uh, president and co-founder of the Farm Sanctuary. Gene, let, let people know where they would go to find you or to follow you or to get more information about what you're doing. What would be the uh, URL or the online site for that? Yes, well, Farm Sanctuary has a website, farmsanctuary.org. People can go there. We also have social media for Farm Sanctuary, and I also have a, an Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. So. Uh, and Farm Sanctuary has Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and also uh, LinkedIn. And I think I think TikTok, I'm not positive, but just check us out online and check out farmsanctuary.org. Yeah, you know, I know I love the fact that you have an, ad an adopt an animal program at Farm Sanctuary. I'm sure that's really uh, something that does goodwill with people that visit. I know you get a lot of visitors. You even have the opportunity for a couple of beds for, you know, B&Bs for people that come and visit and stay. You know, when, when I've talked to people that have transformed or, or changed from being dairy farmers to being dairy conscious, you know, about animals and, and their networks, I think when you have a, a sanctuary like you do, you know, one of the issues is people's, there's this disconnect between people that have a pet and people that see a farm animal as an it or thing. And so let people know, and this is really important because I think people don't realize that even these farm animals, these animals that you have, they have their friendships, they have their social networks, they have their, their ways that they interact in family settings. I think people need to understand that, you know, we need to appreciate the kinds of dynamics that this living structure has, these animals in these situations that in many ways are no different to the kinds of relationships that we create within our own species. So address that, that, that personalization of that a little bit more, because I think there's still too much of a disconnect between people with their pets and then how they view something like a farm animal that you know typically is just raised for their pleasure or food or whatever so can you speak to that just a little bit because you've been around it so much you've watched it for so many years they're 35 plus years so i'm sure you have a lot to comment on that kind of integration of these animals in their own lives absolutely and you know these animals experience the world around them in factory farms they experience pain and fear and cruelty and they are afraid of people. Oftentimes when animals first come to us, they're very afraid of people because all they've known has been pain or cruelty or you know, distress when humans have approached them. And one of the first visitors to our farm in Watkins Glen, New York, was actually a pig farmer. And he went into our pig barn and he saw these 600 pound pigs with these interns, you know, young women maybe weighed 100 pounds each. And this pig farmer was genuinely worried about the well-being of our workers. And he said, those pigs are violent animals. They'll come after you and they'll attack you. And, and I said, you know, when they come here, they learn to trust us. And we've never had pigs attacking people the way you're describing. And he said, look, I've raised pigs for a long time. I, I had this sow once and I took her babies away from her and she came after me. She came through a two by four like it was a toothpick and he made it and he didn't recognize that the way he was interacting with this animal and the way he was taking her babies away, you know, caused her to respond in this way. So people in the farming industry act as if they are entitled to these animals' bodies, to these animals' babies, and, and they treat them very badly and the animals react as many mothers would in, this, in the case of their baby taken away. Um, so, but they're also very social animals. And you know, as I referred to earlier on dairy farms and, and we have our sanctuaries are in New York in California, which are both large dairy producing states. So we have a lot of experience with the dairy industry. And oftentimes, you know, dairy cows to produce milk, they have to have a baby. The baby's taken away at birth and often these animals, if they're male especially, are not considered to be economically viable. So they're sent to the stockyard to be sold sometimes on the day they are born. And, and that occurred occurs all the time. But I remember one particular instance where I came across this calf who was still wet from afterbirth. He was laying in an alleyway, dying of hypothermia. It was a freezing day in upstate New York. And I went to the stockyard workers and I said, what's going on with this calf that's just left here in the alleyway? And the worker said, well, I've got to bury him later today. 
And I said, well, what if I take them off your hands? And the worker said, sure. You know, I was basically doing them a favor because in his mind, this was just something to be disposed of. So I took the calf to a, a nearby veterinarian who looked at him and said, he's got very little chance of survival and it makes no economic sense. And so I said to her that to me, this is not an economic equation. This is an individual animal I want to help. And she finally gave him intravenous fluids. And so I brought him back to the sanctuary and watched him 24 hours a day. And when he first came, he was practically comatose. His eyes were sunken in. He couldn't even lift his head. Uh, but as the intravenous fluid dripped into him, you could see the light coming back into his eyes. He was able to stand up and he started nursing from a bottle and I felt really good. He's on the road to recovery. But after a couple of days of this, he really wasn't thriving. And I was thinking, what's wrong? What, why is he not you know, happy and doing well? And then it dawned on me that he needed to be with other cows. He needed to be with his own people. So I brought him out to the cow barn and I put him in a pen and the other cows all gathered around and started mooing to him. And he started mooing back and he sparked up and he ended up living with us for more than 18 years. And that was Opie. He ended up weighing close to 3000 pounds. And it was just so beautiful to watch him enjoy life and to see how he was able to thrive after he came from this horrible beginning. And a lot of it is just how we treat these other creatures, you know, and in factory farms, they're seen as commodities. They're seen as production units and they're treated terribly. And so the animals who are treated terribly, you know, are going to act out in certain ways because that's all they know. But when they come to the sanctuary, they evolve. Um, and, and farmers who treat animals in these inhumane ways also start losing part of their empathy and, and start um, mistreating others and then denigrating the victims of their abuse. You know, so often like that pig farmer I mentioned talked about how these are violent animals. Actually, we created the conditions for this mother pig to be upset her babies were taken away. And it's, I don't think fair to say that this is a violent animal. This is a mother yeah. who's upset that her babies are taken away. And I think if we have some empathy, we can see that. Gene, you know, we see that pattern of, uh, of abuse happen even in human families. It can go on over generations. So when we look at a farmer who maybe has generations of their family viewing animals in this particular fashion, seeing them in a certain way, I, I, I want to believe somewhere that they're not wholly ignorant, but their consciousness has been dictated by what they feel may be threats to their economics if someone decides to, you know, divert the way they're doing things in a way that they may feel is a challenge to their ability to survive. How, how do you lay the groundwork for breaking through that generational abuse, even with farmers, by uh, maybe somehow creating another avenue where they feel they can still be viable in livelihood if they shift their consciousness about how they view these creatures. What, what's the way to, to bridge that? What's a way to change that educational mindset, so to speak, over these generations of abuse that can go on in whether it's cattle farming or pig farming or whatever? That's exactly what we need to do. We need to come up with new pathways, new off ramps to these farmers who only know this certain way of doing things. Um, unfortunately, we have government money that actually incentivizes uh, people to stay in this very difficult industry. Um, I had a piece in the Washington Post a couple of years ago and the headline was, the best way to help dairy farmers is to get them out of dairy farming. You know, unfortunately, a lot of government programs continue to perpetuate this unsustainable industry. And if instead of doing that, some of these dollars could be used to transition farmers and provide new opportunities, uh, I think that's what we need to see happening. Because these farmers, I don't think, want to be inhumane to animals. I don't think many of them like what they're doing. I know many of them feel at risk. You know, they're on the, on, they're on the edge of going out of business all the time. So if we can find and create new opportunities, I think a lot of these farmers are going to want to take those paths. And we are speaking to farmers who and are you, interested. And, so and you're thinking that challenging that whole subsidy process really has to be had because, you know, we've talked about the fact that if you really had to pay what it costs 
to buy a pound of beef, it could be somewhere close to $60 a pound based on water resources, land resources. So who's going to be able to buy a 99 cent hamburger? Someone has to pay that difference. So you make the point that these government subsidies do that. And now they're making food that is not only devastating to these animals, but certainly not in our own best interest, more accessible economically. So somehow we've got to subsidize people growing real food for people, fruits, vegetables, and so on, and break through that subsidy process. And I imagine that that's an unbelievably difficult thing to do with the lobbies and the powers that be in these government organizations and in these government positions of power. Would you say that that's true? That that's a very difficult nut to crack, so to speak, but we have to crack it somewhere. Yes, it is a tough nut to crack, and we do need to crack it. And I think that aligning with farming organizations and farmers who are just tired of the current machinery, the way it operates, I think we have a chance, but uh, but the machine is, is, is entrenched and it wants to hold on. So it's going to be a process. And I think change happens at the policy level and it also happens on the ground. So it's going to be a bottom up and top down approach. I think if we can work with individual farmers to do things like a dairy farmer, for example, many dairy farmers, um, you know, you have a, a farmer that's ready to retire and the family doesn't want to take over the dairy. So what happens to that property? What's been happening is it's been going to bigger factory farms. You know, small farms have been consolidated into bigger factory farms. If we can create new pathways for these farmers to stay on the property, to grow fruits and vegetables and healthy food that we need more of, uh, that could be a viable option. And there's a bill we had introduced in New York State, we're gonna continue working on this called the Farmer Opportunity Bill. And it takes a, an annual $30 million a year grant program uh, that's intended to preserve farmland. That money has been used to consolidate dairy farms. So this Farmer Opportunity Bill would instead take that $30 million and use it to support uh, small farms, plant-based farms, uh, community-oriented farms, and would not allow this dairy industry consolidation to continue with public resources. So, you know, looking at the, the dollars that are currently being spent and shifting them into a more sensible direction is something we're doing a lot to try to figure out right now. That's fantastic. You know, we, we talked before a little bit about the intensive uh, arrangement of factory farms, the the high density you know, accumulation of animals next to each other, the massive use of antibiotics to try to prevent infections. As a physician, I think people need to realize because it, it can be argued and people have argued this, that even coming through pandemics like we just did, uh, you know, with uh, COVID infections and so on, many of these kinds of infections are what we call zoonotic. They spread from animal to man. And I think people need to realize that our dependency on this intensive housing and crating and, and, and this, these ghettos of animals under deplorable conditions wind up becoming a breeding ground that, can, that comes back to haunt us by having these transfer of infections that, that really can be resolved to a great extent by moving away from that kind of intensive factory farming. Is that something that you've, you've seen and, 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 and you can get on board with in terms of your own thinking? Absolutely. These animals are confined in these stressful, filthy conditions that are our breeding, breeding ground for disease. Most of the antibiotics used in the United States are fed to farm animals to keep them alive and growing in these factory farms, which also results in the development of antibiotic resistant pathogens. So when you need, uh, you know, formerly life-saving drugs, they don't work like they used to on, on these various pathogens. So factory farming is bad for animals. It's bad for people. It's bad for the environment. When you have animals confined by the thousands, they're producing tons and tons of manure, which then is polluting the local community. And you have neighbors near factory farms where they're actually spewing out like liquid manure into the air. It gets on people's property, gets on their houses. It hurts local communities. So that's another health issue with people and people who work in factory farms. I mentioned earlier avian influenza, which has killed tens of millions of birds so far. Um, that's also in fact can infect people. And the first person who was, you know, infected with this recent strain of avian influenza was a worker who actually came was from a prison, and prison labor is used 
on these factory farms as well. So there are so many forms of injustice associated with the system and people who work in factory farms and people who work in slaughterhouses are also at risk along with people who are, who are eating right. food that is unhealthy and is making us sick. And in that animal waste, you know, uh, people like climate healers and others have suggested that the radiating force of methane that's coming from animal waste is significantly worse in its, in its global warming potential than carbon dioxide from fossil fuel burning. And I found it really interesting, and I'm sure this must burn you because it burns me too, that when you look at these intergovernmental panels that are um, taking the stand of changing global warming, and they keep focusing on the fossil fuel changes by better, you know, machines and cars and so on, and overlooking the biggest contribution, which is animal agriculture and animal, you know, farm animal production, food production, um, that they're taking their information from organizations like the uh, Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN that is clearly in bed with, uh, with organizations that are involved in meat, dairy and egg production how how do we how do we mobilize to even challenge that whole process because we're getting such misinformation with a focus shifted away from the real the real cause of this problem which is you know the changes in all of the devastation of land for animal grazing and animal raising and and all the devastation to animals with methane production we somehow need to mobilize to cut through that whole level of misinformation how do you see that maybe changing and happening a little bit better i think it's just an ongoing process of education we need to just keep talking about it raising awareness about it educating people about it and then demonstrating solutions. There's a veganic farm I know of, for example, in Mesa, Arizona, that is growing plant-based foods and sequestering carbon in the soil, growing good food for the local market, and also doing a very good job in terms of greenhouse gas emission mitigation. So I think we need to show solutions, but we need to continuously uh, challenge the biases and, and the misstatements that are being promulgated to maintain this current system. And, and, as, you, the, the, and the, as you mentioned, we just need to keep educating people to move into being vegan. I mean, they, they, we've just got to stop our, our dependency on animal foods. I mean, it, it just really comes down to that. And you've you've talked about it and so many people have talked about it. And I loved, I loved your message because a lot of times when people start thinking about shifting into a vegan lifestyle, they have this sense of deprivation that will be associated with that. And uh, you made a quote that I have resonated with for the 40 plus years that I've been involved on a, on a plant vegan path. And that is, it's not about deprivation, it's about inspiration. And, and, and I love that idea because, you know, many years ago, there was a very famous poet, a Sufi poet that said, when you truly become a lover, duties become inspirations. And I changed that into this idea that when you truly love yourself and you love everything outside of yourself, other species, the planet, as you love yourself, the duties of responsible action, the choices that um, make us aware of how we can be more cognizant of the impact of what we do on the world around us becomes inspirational. So, you know, you get up and you have that kind of inspiration for taking an active role in something that supports all the sanctity of life within you and all around us. So I love that idea of inspiration. And I know it's been an inspirational thing for you and a game changer for you in your own athletic prowess. Tell us about that. I know you like to run uh, triathlons. Are you still doing any of that? I haven't done those for a couple of years now, but yes, when I got into my fifties, I thought, you know, as a long time vegan, I wanted to demonstrate that you can get everything you need nutritionally to do you know, athletic feats. So I, I did six marathons. I did a number of triathlons, including an Ironman. And I haven't done one for a while, but, you know, as, and some of the best athletes in the world are, are plant-based. And there was no a film, question. you know, Game Changers, right? Where it demonstrated that these high performing athletes are getting everything they need with plants and we do not need to eat animal food. So I did a little bit of that for a while. And, uh, you know, I still try to keep active, but I'm not doing nearly what I used to do. Uh, Gene, before we break, do you have any final words you'd like to share with the audience? Any words of wisdom, any ideas or thoughts that you'd like to share before we break? You know, I think, you know, one thing I often just raise is and ask the question is, if we can live well without causing unnecessary harm, why wouldn't we? 
right? And just because we've grown up with certain habits uh, doesn't mean we need to hold on to those habits. And I think it's important for people to just have open minds, uh, to look at things as they are, and then ultimately to make choices that we can feel good about instead of saying, don't tell me I don't wanna know about factory farming, which often people say, there's a, obviously a disconnect there. So to make choices that we can feel good about that are aligned with our own values and aligned with our own interests. And if people take that sort of perspective, I think a, a lot of very good things can happen. Well, I really wanna thank you for taking the time today to come and share your information with us. And I encourage our audience to uh, follow Gene, to follow uh, Farm Sanctuary, make whatever contribution you can, take some active steps in your own activism, locally, globally, however you wanna do it, to support this process that we all have to do for our really the survival of all species on this planet, including us and all the animals that are connected with us. And uh, I want to, uh, and, and the, uh, the location for Gene and his site will be in our show notes too, so you'll see those too. And I want to especially thank our uh, audience out there because without you, I couldn't do this. We couldn't do what we do. Uh, I encourage you uh, to uh, seek out the information of the National Health Association. And I thank you for being part of this very active community. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, on behalf of the National Health Association. I thank you and I look forward to seeing you on our next podcast. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review and we'll see you on the next show.